Okay, thanks. So uh, this workshop, as we all know, is on complexity and simplicity, and we often interpret these terms in the context of mechanism design, which is you know, definitely very appropriate. We'll hear a lot about it in the rest of the week. I decided to try and uh, think about these concepts in the context of networks. And so what I'm gonna talk to you about today is agents performing simple behavior in a network context that as a result gives rise to some sort of global structure of societal significance. So the human condition is a fundamentally networked one. Um, many important games that we play that govern human behavior are played in a network context as defined by our social networks or our business relationships or our geographical networks or networks of ideas. This beautiful picture I found on the blog, All Things Graft, and it's a picture of the Wikipedia network um, related to the human condition. And for those of you, so every node is a web page and the links are uh, link, hyperlinks between the web pages. And an automated community detection algorithm found the following clusters that are uh, what the essence of the human condition. And the people here are the main uh, contributors to those clusters. So you can see what's going on there. Um, Mostly I included this because it's a beautiful picture of a network. Uh, so in network context, we have uh, fundamentally local interactions. So people are going to interact locally with their neighbors in this network. And these local interactions are gonna give rise to a global emergent structure. So uh, here, for example, is a uh, geographical network. This is a 2D lattice. Every point in this lattice is colored red or blue. And the points are, uh, you can think about them as agents. They want to be in a local neighborhood that is uh, in which they are not a minority. So initially we have everything is um, colored randomly and as the agents move you can see these local interactions that they want to be not a minority in their local neighborhood is giving rise to a global sort of structure in which we have not as much integration as in the initial picture but we have some sort of uh, uh, like mixture of sort of local homogeny but global integration and so this uh, demo was simula it's a simulation that was written by Brendan and Brendan Bobby and I are working on trying to uh, formalize some notions of this global structure as a result of these local behaviors um, I'll talk a little more about shelling this, this simulation in a 1d setting uh, in, later in this talk so I'm going to discuss these uh, con the, these uh, uh, thesis through the following three examples. First, I'm going to describe cooperation as an emergent structure in a networked setting. So social networks, uh, it's pretty obvious that in a community, members of a community tend to cooperate with each other, often despite strong incentives to cheat and gain on one's partner. And this is true even in tech-mediated markets like online gaming, e-commerce sites, the sharing economy, where the uh, incentives to deviate are strong and also that it's not that easy to punish somebody for cheating because they can always re-enter the system under a new pseudonym. So there's a large degree of anonymity in these tech-mediated markets. Uh, so why do people cooperate? Um, what we are going to argue in this paper is that uh, cooperation arises as the network and the behaviors co-evolve, giving rise to the formation of a sort of social capital. Where by social capital here, I mean the degree of friendships of a cooperator. So a cooperator by cooperating can build up many, many relationships and this social capital uh, is very valuable to them and it's costly to destroy. So this sustains cooperation. Uh, this is joint work with Brendan and Brian Rogers. Um, so we model cooperation using a prisoner's dilemma game as a standard in the economics literature. Uh, this is a bi matrix game. There's two agents. Uh, they can choose to cooperate or defect. Mutual cooperation gives a payoff of one to each agent. 
Uh, but by defecting on a cooperator, you can gain an amount of A at a cost of B to your partner. And mutual defection has a payout of zero to each agent. So iterated uh, uh, deletion of dominated strategies, you can easily see that the dominant strategy here is for both agents to defect. Um, however, for appropriate setting of the parameters A and B, we'll see that uh, mutual cooperation is the socially efficient outcome. Um, and so this is used to model cooperation, and uh, certainly in a single shot game, there is a strong incentive to defect, and we do see defection in laboratory experiments with uh, a single shot game. But in society, we see a lot of cooperation, and so there's a bunch of theory that's been developed to explain cooperation in these settings. And sort of the classic result here is the uh, Folk theorem, which says that in a repeated setting of this game, agents will cooperate uh, because if they're sufficiently patient, because they would rather sustain the cooperation payoff in the future than cash out on the defection payoff today. Uh, we also have a lot of literature explaining cooperation in networked settings. Uh, the things that are able to support cooperation in network settings range from a sort of community enforcement norm through a grim trigger strategy in which if you ever see any defection, you just defect on all your partners, and this will spread like a disease throughout the network, and so the threat, uh, so you will eventually get defected upon yourself, and the threat of this prevents you from defecting in the first place. Uh, we also see reputation mechanisms sustaining cooperation, and this is, uh, for example, in eBay, um, or structured exogenous penalties for new uh, members of the community, and there's a line of economics literature analyzing that. In our paper, as I've mentioned, what we're going to show is that the coevolution of networks and behaviors will sustain cooperation through the formation of social capital. And the neat thing in our model, which I haven't seen before, is that we're able to sustain a mixture, a, a heterogeneous mixture of cooperation and defection. So it's not necessary that the entire society cooperate. We can support, in a stable equilibrium, a fraction of society cooperating and a fraction of society defecting. So let me introduce the model to you. Uh, it's going to be a repeated model played in a networked setting. Every day, the following events happen. First, we have a population churn. So the agents are going to die with probability 1 minus delta. And then in order to keep the uh, population size static, we have uh, new agents that are born to replace the dead. So you can think about this delta. It plays the role of a discount factor. Um, after that, we, agents are going to, we have the network formation step. So agents are going to form relationships. And we're going to bound the number of relationships that an agent can sponsor by some parameter k. So the links here are directed. Each relationship is sponsored by some agent. And the number of, a, of relationships you can sponsor is at most k. Uh, so agents with less than k sponsored relationships, perhaps because their partners died or they chose to sever those links, those guys can propose new relationships. And then uh, when you get a proposal for a relationship, uh, as an agent, you can choose to accept that or reject it. So agents that receive proposals uh, either accept or reject them. Maybe we get the following network. Uh, Notice that because of the bounded out degree, there's also an implied bound on the total number of relationships that you can have as an agent. And we believe that our results will also work if you just uh, want to write that into the model instead of having this sponsorship type thing going on. Um, so after that, the agents are going to uh, play the prisoner's dilemma game on all of their links. And uh, in this game, each agent is going to choose some strategy that they're going to play on all of their relationships. So you can either choose to cooperate or defect, and you do that on all of your relationships. And then uh, after people choose their strategies, the payoffs are realized, and 
the agents can sever any links that they choose to. So for example, maybe this middle agent who chose to cooperate uh, is going to sever the links to his partners that chose to defect on him, both the one that's sponsoring the relationship to him and the one that he's sponsoring the relationship to. So something like that happens. Um, so that this is the, the stage game. This is repeated over time. In every round, when you have a new relationship proposed to you, the, since there is complete anonymity in our network, you don't know anything about the identity of that person or his past behaviors. Uh, and what we're going to show is that in this model, the following simple behavior is in fact an equilibrium that gives rise to an interesting global structure. Uh, so the first thing is consistency, which means at birth, I'm going to assume that everybody is going to pick whether to cooperate for their entire lifetime or defect for their entire lifetime. And they pick this with a probability Q. Next is exclusivity. Uh, so when a cooperator, uh, so defectors are always going to accept in links. That's the best dominant thing for them to do. But when a cooperator uh, sees an in link, they should decide whether to accept it or not. And whether they want to accept it or not might be a function of the proportion of in links that are coming from defectors versus cooperators. So we're going to allow cooperators to probabilistically accept in links. Uh, and the uh, exclusivity condition says that cooperators are going to accept in links with a probability P. So our behavior here is parameterized by two probabilities, Q, the probability with which you choose to cooperate, and P, the probability with which cooperators choose to accept in links. Uh, for those of you that remember the uh, conference version of this paper, the journal version, which is what I'm talking about now, this is exclusivity condition is the new feature, and it allows us to sustain our results for a larger range of parameters. PMQ is the same for all? Or? Yes, it's a glo global thing. Sorry, when you say cooperate with probability Q, you don't mean that at each stage I... Cooperate. No, at birth, right, at birth you, you choose this, and then you do that for the rest of your life. Uh, so given that uh, everybody's cooperative, you know, given a sort of a P and a Q, uh, the link management portion of your strategy is determined. Uh, clearly, if you know that people are being consistent, uh, then you should be unforgiving, meaning you should break links to people that you see defecting on you. And you should be trusting, meaning you should keep links to people that have cooperated with you in the past. And this uh, link management policy is what gives rise to the social capital. Basically, if you're a cooperator, when you get an in-link from another cooperator, that's going to be sustained throughout the lifetime of those cooperators. And this means that cooperators can build up their neighborhood to be larger than that of defectors. In fact, uh, they can have as many as twice as many relationships as the defectors over their lifetime. And so now I want to argue that this simple behavior forms an equilibrium in the system. In order to see that, I'm going to, uh, you know, in the paper we derive formulas for when people are indifferent between being consistent and being exclusive and show some fixed points of these formulas. I'll do this pictorially in this talk. So. We have the consistency. If I'm going to be uh, probabilistic about whether I decide to be a cooperator or a defector, I must be uh, indifferent between these two conditions in equilibrium. So we can write down the consistency condition, which uh, says if everybody else is playing this behavior with parameters P and Q, when am I indifferent between cooperating and defecting? And similarly, uh, we can write down the exclusivity condition, uh, which says that when are cooperators, if everybody else is performing with PQ, when are cooperators indifferent between accepting and rejecting the in-links? So to understand why the graph looks like this, I've chosen some particular uh, parameters of my prisoner's dilemma game and my patients, A, B, and delta. And let's see if we can understand the regions in this plot. So first, uh, if the Q, the proportion of, you know, so this is the probability with which someone cooperates at birth. If people are unlikely to cooperate at birth, the proportion of cooperators in the population is pretty small. So even if they're accepted in links with a high probability, uh, it's not going to be the case that a cooperator will be able to build up the social capital during his lifetime. And so uh, it's better to defect. 
On the other hand, if there's a lot of cooperators in the world, uh, even if they're accepting in links very rapidly, it could be the case if A is high enough that you prefer to defect because even if you totally built out your social capital, you maxed out your social capital, you would still be better off with half as many relationships defecting every time if A is high enough. I am bored when I am bored and I have no choice. You flip, yeah, you flip a coin with probability Q. I want to argue that doing this, this prescribed strategy, is the best response for you. So I need to see when, when I get fixed points of these conditions. Yeah? A and B are the parameters of the prisoner's dilemma game. So A is the gain that you get by defecting on a cooperator. So the defector payoff is one plus A. Um, so if A is very large, it's very, very uh, beneficial to defect. Um, Shouldn't B, B be more than A? Because uh, it's, the hard you. it's one plus A versus minus B. So you need one plus A minus B to be greater, to be less, uh, less than two. Less than two. In order, you're asking about when is it social welfare to be mutual cooperation? So, so uh, probably everybody else can see this here, but uh, you, uh, uh, you want to prove, you, you want to find conditions under which this, uh, this is an equilibrium, this, this strategy is an equilibrium. Yes. Uh, and what is the strategy space? Uh, so the strat, yeah, it's, we uh, develop formally the strategy space in the paper. You have a mapping of uh, the observed history to your actions, and the history that you observe is, uh, you can think about yourself as a computer with many ports. On every port, you observe uh, the history of play on that port. You don't have memory of but you, you don't know, yeah, you don't have memory of others, so you don't know like that there's this guy named Christos that keeps defecting on me. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> right. Um, so then, so the, in these regions, you would prefer to defect, even if it, when everybody else is playing uh, according to that particular PQ. Uh, in this region, so now. Let's imagine that maybe there's not even very much cooperation, but the cooperators are pretty exclusive. So they're, they're hesitant to start relationships with people. That means that uh, defectors, the number of effective relationships that defectors can form every round is dampened by P, the probability that cooperators accept relationships. However, you know, if the delta is high enough, so cooperators are long-lived, they're still eventually able to build up a full social capital. So they're able, still able to max out their, na their neighborhoods. And so you can imagine that you'll get a, a area here where because of this exclusivity, we're able to uh, sustain the cooperation, the choice to cooperate at birth. <coughs> so that's for the, the Consistency, so we, we get some shape like this where uh, newborns are indifferent between cooperating and defecting when everyone else in the world is playing according to PQ. We also uh, should look at the exclusivity condition and understand uh, when a cooperator is indifferent between accepting and rejecting inlinks. And this, of course, depends on the proportion of uh, inlinks that are being thrown from cooperators versus defectors. Uh, if there aren't very many cooperators in the world, then the inlinks that are being thrown are going to come more from defectors, and so you prefer to reject all inlinks. Uh, on the other hand, if there are many cooperators, then um, the inlinks that are being thrown are going to be largely from cooperators. This is because cooperators keep dying, so new cooperators come and are throwing inlinks, and so you'll prefer to accept inlinks. Uh, but this is the interesting region here, which is that even if cooperators are not that frequent, 
uh, if they're exclusive, it takes a long time for them to search for other cooperators. And so we get a lot of in-links being thrown from cooperators. Um, and so the exclusivity and difference condition is going to look something like this. So the interesting thing about this uh, is that, well, first of all, any place where these two curves cross is going to be an equilibrium. And the cool equilibrium here is this one. Uh, it's in fact stable, which means that if the population is perturbed a little bit, uh, somebody trembles and makes a mistake about being a uh, newborn that's cooperating or accepting, rejecting in links, it will self-correct and return to this point. So this is a pretty stable prediction in this particular game. And it has a mixture of cooperation and defection. Yeah? So are there the parameters A, B, and delta where they don't cross? Yeah, so this is all uh, dependent on the parameters A, B, and delta. We can uh, get all, the, the shapes are always like this, but it could be that this red line is up here, meaning that full cooperation is the stable equilibrium. Um, or it could be that the red shape is completely included in here, in which case uh, full defection is the only equilibrium. Is the pure equilibrium always, maybe top left corner or bottom left? Bottom left is always an equilibrium. So it's always an equilibrium for everybody to defect and never accept any in links. Um, okay, so this is the, the sort of interesting cooperation story I had to tell. We had a simple sort of prescribed behavior and we were able to see this neat mixture of cooperation and defection in, in the society due to this sort of exclusivity, and it required this sort of exclusivity on the part of cooperators. The second example I'd like to discuss is segregation. So uh, in 1969, Thomas Schelling introduced a model of segregation in which agents are not inherently racist, but they'd like to not be a minority in their local neighborhood. And if they are a minority in their local neighborhood, they're gonna swap houses with other people until they find a place where they're happy. Uh, and so we show in this paper that these sort of dynamics are going to cause segregation on a local, but not global scale. And this is therefore the emergent structure that we're interested in. And really what's going on in this paper is that in the initial conditions, neighborhoods with a slight imbalance so that are you know, slightly more red than blue are just a very slight imbalance is enough to cause that local neighborhood to tip, at which point it becomes immune to immigration. And so since this is happening very frequently, we're gonna get a lot of local neighborhoods that are monochromatic, but they're very mixed at a neighborhood scale. So the neighborhoods themselves are in an integrated pattern. So to see this happening, uh, let me define the model a little more formally. I'm gonna, I showed you a simulation in the beginning on a 2D lattice. Uh, we actually, we're currently working on that model, uh, but our results that I'll tell you about today uh, that we have formal proofs of are in a 1D lattice. Uh, so initially every node is uh, red or blue with probability half. You, for each node, you can define the neighborhood of that node, which is the W guys on the left of that node, the W guys on the right, and that node itself. So that's two W plus one node. And we say that a node is happy if at least a tau fraction of his neighbors are of the same type as he is. So in this particular picture, this red node is happy because he has uh, two neighbors that are red and uh, two that are blue. So the important parameters in this model are gonna be the uh, window size W and the size of the society N. Uh, each day, I, yeah? Now, you're always using a half? Or? I'm going to use a half in the results I discuss now. It's interesting to look at tau ranging. As tau gets smaller, people are becoming more tolerant. And um, so I'll discuss in a few slides what happens as, tau, as people become more tolerant. Um, so each day, what happens is I'm going to select two individuals at random. This is the simple behavior part. And if they're both unhappy and oppositely colored, they're gonna swap neighborhoods. And because tau is 0.5 or even less, any, any tau between zero and 0.5, that means after they swap, they'll be happy. Um, 
So in this setup, for example, this blue node is unhappy, uh, and also this red node is unhappy, and therefore they're both gonna swap neighborhoods, swap houses, and now they're both happy because before there was a majority red in this neighborhood, now there's a red guy there. Before there was a majority blue in this neighborhood, and now there's a blue guy there. Um, but notice that because of this swap, we could create new unhappy nodes. For example, this node, when this used to be red, was happy, and now he's unhappy. So uh, what's the result of this simple behavior? What sort of setups could we end up in? You know, what, what are the final configurations? What might they look like? Well, you can imagine two things, like two extremes. And it's easy to come up with. In one extreme, we have sort of global segregation on the scale of the size of the society, in which we have half the ring being red and half the ring being blue. In the other uh, extreme, we have local segregation on the size of the neighborhood. So we can have alternating segments of length W plus one. Now every guy at the edge of one of these alternating segments has exactly half that are the same color as him and half that are a different color, so he's happy. So even the, the marginal guys are happy. Um, so these are sort of a, two different, very different predictions, qualitatively different predictions. We have global segregation versus local segregation. Um, and more uh, formally, I can define segregation to be the uh, weighted average run length in the converged final state. So in prior work, well, in Schelling's beautiful 69 paper, he simulated this process using uh, coins on a, on a grid, uh, on a checkerboard, and he noted that, uh, well, or on a ring, he noted that for uh, small-sized societies, the segregation for Psi n equals 70 and w equals 4, the segregation was like 12, which, you know, is that like n over 2 or is that like w plus 1? Who knows? Um, then in 2001, uh, Peyton Young did a perturbed analysis of this dynamic in which agents make mistakes when they decide whether to move or not with some small probability. And so, you know, I, I think I'm unhappy even if I'm happy with some small probability. And as we send that probability to zero, we can look at the limit, and the limit showed global segregation. Um, but in our paper, we do an exact analysis and we see only local segregation. So there's, uh, you know, passing to the limit is, there, there's something going on here that's not uh, reflective of the actual dynamic when you pass to the limit. Uh, and then uh, following our work, so this is answering Eva's question, uh, we were, uh, this group, uh, Louis Pay et al, showed that uh, as you vary the tolerance of agents, you get varying amounts of segregation. It's always local in the sense that it doesn't depend on the size of the society, but it could be uh, more or less um, uh, size of segregation. So as agents get more tolerant, we get larger segregation at first, yeah? <coughs> These two results you're mentioning for you and, and these guys uh, also do the perturbed analysis? No, these are exact analysis. There's no random mistakes? There's no random mistakes. So yeah. it's not clear that the Peyton band is happening because he takes the limit or because there are mistakes, I mean, mistakes cause it. Yeah, I mean, he takes the limit, uh, so he gets an analysis for if there are mistakes with epsilon, and then if you take that epsilon to zero, you get order n. Um, you could say, yeah, people actually do make mistakes in society, and so his analysis is more predictive, but it's not the original dynamic, yeah? Does perturbed analysis say that that's kind of a stable like it, does, does it say anything about the stability of the situation? Um, I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah? Is this the, the you analyze 
the expected size of the accusation? Yeah, the, av the weighted average, so yeah. It, it, does this hold with hyperbability as well? Oh, no. uh, sure. Yes? Regarding the perturbed analysis, are the mistakes just straight mistakes, or are they kind of proportional mistakes in measurement? Uh, it's been a while since I read the paper. I believe they're proportional, though. So here's a version to interpret uh, Ruta's question, I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, if I take the perturbed version, uh, your uh, limit, is it saying that your limit is not stable? Mm, I see. Um, if you take the perturbed vision, then... If you take the limit in your yes. version, yes. then it increases error. Yes. Yes. It's not stable, right? Yes. Okay, so, and this is the uh, result that we get. Actually, in the stock paper, we just have a W squared here. We've since improved that to linear. Um, but it's sort of the same qualitative statement that local, these dynamics give you only local segregation. And to see why, uh, this is, yeah? How does that work with the previous, if this could go to exponential, where you're going Oh, to yeah, I didn't talk very much about that. So. This, and uh, actually in the 2D model, we're, we're actually analyzing half minus epsilon right now. So as, as you take the tolerance down, so people become more tolerant. Uh, as you take tau down, people become more tolerant. So as I'm uh, uh, more tolerant, at, say half minus epsilon, initially almost everybody is happy, right? Because your expected neighborhood composition is half half. And so you're, you're likely to be happy and uh, there's sort of exponentially far apart pockets where they uh, are unhappy because their neighborhood composition is far from its expectation. And those uh, neighborhoods are going to start growing. Those neighborhoods tip, and they become monochromatic. But they're very far apart, and there's nothing to stop them from, you know, the people at the edge of those neighborhoods become unhappy as the neighborhood approaches them. And it encroaches on this initially, like, complacent, okay people. And this wave of immigration is just going to grow and grow and grow. And the only thing that stops it is one of the other t uh, initially, like, exponentially far apart uh, places that are growing in, of the opposite color in the opposite direction. So th what happens is as I get tau, people become a little more tolerant. I get exponential segregation. And then as I, people become incredibly tolerant, so if I don't, if I need like say, it's easy to think about a quarter of my neighborhood being like me, uh, then I'm, uh, even if I'm on the edge of a monochromatic neighborhood in the initial configuration, I'm likely to be happy because of the stuff on the other side. And so uh, as we get very small tows, we get a uh, constant size segregation because basically nothing changes. So your linear bound is for which tau? One half, exactly one half. Uh, Nicole, is it monotonic in tau or is it non-monotonicity in the size of the segregation? So this continuity so is that? So what you just said implies non-monotonicity. Uh, yeah, yeah. So one half is going to give less segregation than, than one half minus epsilon. Nine, nine, nine. Yeah. Um, so the proof, the intuition for the proof is following this uh, concept that we define called a firewall. If you think about it, any sequence of W plus 1 like types is going to be stable throughout the course of the dynamics uh, because even the guys on the fringe of this are happy no matter what's happening, even if this was a sea of red outside this segment, even this guy is happy. And so these configurations are stable with respect to the dynamics. This already shows you that segregation isn't global because these configurations have a probability of 2 to the minus w of existing. And so uh, every 2 to the w you know, length, so I'm going to have one of these. And as soon as I have two of these of, say, blue, I can't have a red neighborhood longer than length 2 to the w. All right? So, uh, the key in the proof 
So, so the segregation is at most the distance between these types of firewalls. And the key in the proof is to show that these are actually very frequent because they get born as a result of the dynamics. So they become more frequent as the dynamics evolve. And I'm not going to give you the uh, actual proof of how that happens. Um, but the idea is that if you have a neighborhood that's slightly more biased in the initial configuration, say like this part here, then as the dynamics evolve, that bias just grows. And so we have a particular uh, configuration of biases that we call a firewall incubator that will give birth to firewalls. And we show that these firewall incubators are pretty frequent. And you can see this happening in this simulation, which was coded by uh, G. Kamath, um, that as time grows, the initially biased things become more and more extreme until I get a final state where I have a mixture of red and blue neighborhoods. And so this is the emergent structure of these local, simple local dynamics. Okay. Um, for more details about that proof, you can ask me offline. Uh, I, I, Thought in the survey talk, I don't have time to go over every is proof. The <laughs> of the w large, or is that constant? Or, I mean, is in the analysis, uh, W should be a large, and then it's going to affect the probabilities in the statement. But um, N is lar much larger. And we need pretty massive constants. <laughs> uh, so the final setting I'd like to discuss here is um, learning. So, uh, and we'll hear more about this from Ben Golub later in the week. Um, but what we look at here is thinking about social networks as aggregating beliefs. And we are, argue that social networks are effective at aggregating and spreading beliefs uh, due to their sparse and expansive structure. So the sparsity there's two phases here. In the first phase, the sparsity is going to allow independent beliefs to sort of form in different parts of the network. And then the expansiveness is going to cause it to uh, flood the entire network, such that at the end of the day, the entire network has a consensus on the majority, on the original majority belief. So I have in mind setups like, you know, uh, should my baby sleep on her back or her stomach? Everybody has some belief about this, and I want to understand when do we reach consensus eventually on the majority belief. So there's a blue and a red state of the world. The agent's beliefs are initially either blue or red, and let's say it's biased towards blue, so blue is the majority belief. They're drawn independently across agents in the network, and the opinions of the agents are initially empty and updated over time. So in this model, the beliefs are private information, the opinions are public information, and agents are going to react to their friends' opinions and update their own opinion accordingly. And I want to understand when do all the opinions match the majority belief. So the behavior that we're going to analyze, which is a sort of a behavioral model, it's not a rational model uh, is the following. Uh, I repeatedly, I'm going to select a random agent. And this guy is going to update his opinion to the majority of his neighbors. I don't actually need majority here. I need some Boolean, monotone Boolean function. Um, and uh, then if there's ties, they'll break the uh, tie with their own belief. OK, so here. The first agent is asked, and he has no friends with any opinions, so he reports an opinion that's equal to his own belief. Then maybe this agent is asked and has no friends with opinions, so he reports his own belief. Now this guy is asked. He has two friends with opinions and one without. There's a tie among his friends with opinions, so he reports his own belief. Uh, now this guy is asked, and the majority of his neighbor's opinions uh, are blue, even though his own belief is red, he'll state blue. And then maybe we ask this guy again, and he states blue. So you can get asked repeatedly. Um, 
prior work in this model, so I'm just here listing prior work in this model where the beliefs and the opinions are binary. There's a lot more work when they're continuous, when they're, they come from a continuum, which Ben Golub will discuss later. Uh, but when it's binary, we have uh, results saying that um, in a synchronous model, when every agent is updating uh, synchronously, then uh, you know after the first step, there's enough information in the network for an observer to understand what the majority opinion was, because after the first step, everybody would report their belief as their opinion. But uh, because of the synchronicity, we can cause the agents to converge on a consensus on the minority opinion. Um, the, uh, another line of work is looking at this other sort of effect of these kinds of models, which is information suppression. That means that even, uh, so here if we have asynchronous behavior, even if the agents are rationally updating, after some time they could start to rationally ignore their own belief because there's so many opinions about, uh, the, among their neighborhood that don't match their own belief that they start to ignore their own belief and you get hurting again on a minority opinion. And our result is that certain social networks are good information aggregators, so we avoid both this information loss and the information suppression problems. Namely, we reach consensus on the majority belief with high probability, and the conditions that we need are that the networks are sparse, so the max degree is bounded, and the networks are expansive, so the second eigenvalue is bounded away from one. Um, we, we might be able to relax both of these, but we're not quite sure. We're, we're working on that at the moment. Uh, so, to, yeah? Does the result apply to random three regular graphs? Random three regular, yes. They will be spar, I mean, they, they have a bounded max degree and they will be expansive because I think so I've worked on this a while back. What I remember is that if you have, let's say, 51% pluses and 49% minuses on a random three regular graph with random initialization, there will be a linear fraction which will remain at the minority opinion after converting. We, we can talk about it later. Okay. Um. So to see how this happens, I'll give you a sketch of the proof. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, there's two phases here. So the first phase, we're gonna have a bounded degree is gonna guarantee that most opinions are independent. So first we have uh, a bunch of agents developing independent uh, opinions, okay? And then in the second stage, these, now these different sort of local clusters of independent opinions, the majority of them are gonna be the right color. And the second phase, the expansion, is gonna cause this color to spread throughout the entire network. So let's first discuss how we get a uh, majority. So the first thing, uh, let, let's see what agents can impact some particular guy's opinion at time t. First, first thing to note, I actually skipped this slide, uh, but is that the expected opinion of an agent is going to be blue at the end of the time. Why? Because the opinion of an agent at, after the convergence is a function of the initial underlying beliefs of the entire society. This is a Boolean, a monotone Boolean function. And so uh, if the inputs to a monotone Boolean function are biased towards blue, then the output is biased towards blue. But that's not enough to get our result. We want this to hold with high probability. So we need to talk about the independence of various opinions and argue that for sufficiently long, the, the, the opinions of two people are sufficiently independent such that we can apply uh, uh, concentration bounds to argue that the majority is blue with high probability. So to do that, um, you can track the, which agents impact some particular guy's opinion at, at time capital T. And so you, who, those people are gonna be the people who have announced an opinion before the center uh, and are attached to him or before somebody who's attached to the center and their opinion is before. So I need to find paths in this graph that start at some time t, have increasing time stamps, and end up at that center. 
those are the guys that could impact the center's opinion at time capital T. And uh, so what we need to argue is that the guys that can impact this center's opinion at time capital T are disjoint from the guys that could impact this other random node's opinion at time capital T. And that's going to be uh, sufficient to guarantee that these two are independent. So to bound the probability that these subgraphs intersect, we can run the process backwards from the center and track the growth of these balls. And this is where the bounded degree comes in. So I don't have time to go into this, but uh, because of bounded degree, the, these balls are growing kind of like coupon collector problems. And so we can uh, allow something like polylog steps uh, and still have these things be independent. So that means that after uh, something like linear number of time steps, I have a situation in which most people have announced an opinion and more of the opinions are blue than red. Now I'm gonna use the expansiveness to argue that at, after this, now I'm entering phase two. So in phase two, every time I ask somebody to announce, they're more likely to have more blue neighbors than red neighbors because expansive graphs look kind of like random graphs, which means that the number of agents that will announce blue is more than the number that will announce red if chosen, which means that I have a biased random walk. And once this random walk uh, reaches N, I have this emergent structure where everybody's opinion matches the majority belief. Um, now I think I'm one minute over time, so I will just conclude with this slide. sense in which your nice material equilibrium of the interior PQ equilibrium is selected rather than say PQ equals zero, which is just as stable as that one. And topic, talking on that, uh, just one correction to a statement you made. The Fock theorem does not say that people will cooperate, people might cooperate. It's yes. a big difference. The whole issue of how you get cooperation rather than anything is a very serious issue. And that's exactly the issue I'm addressing now. Yes, I see. Um, so. I don't know how to select a particular equilibrium. Uh, I mean, even I, I don't see why the one we predict, the one we like, is more easy to select than the zero zero equilibrium. It sort of depends on where you start. If I have a social norm, like you know, I start off my world where people are just nice because why? Let, let's just try to be nice. Then I'm starting at a one one p equals one q equals one. They will. Uh, sort of follow self-correcting dynamics and reach the PQ that I predict. If I start off in a world where everybody's mean. Yeah, the dynamic will do that. And one jump that's implied by the stability, like, I mean, okay, so I need a little bit of, if people are fully rational and they understand that this is happening, they might, you know, then whatever. But if, if uh, they're just. If they're fully rational, then, you, then they'll do much more sophisticated things yeah, than that. And exactly. But uh, the stability implies that if they're just sort of thinking that PQ is stationary, they will reach the PQ that I like if they start at all being nice. If they start at all being mean, then they'll just stay there. Yeah? So I guess another question about uh, initial conditions. So with the segregation model, <clears throat> we don't think that in real world people just you know get allocated randomly at first, right? And, so, so this model really seems to capture something about segregation, but there's also an interesting question of how did they get in that situation in the first place? Well, you know, was tolerance higher before, or is something else going on? Yeah, um, I look at it more as sort of, well, first of all, I, I, we were just formally analyzing the shelling dynamics we thought was an interesting exercise, but also it kind of informs some sort of policy recommendations that could be applied intuitively even to societies that are already some way along the path in this process, uh, which might be things like you really need to get these firewalls to form frequently enough. So you might want to do this by, say, uh, introducing low-income housing or something that's going to really pin some people to some locations as opposed to trying to uh, change the tolerance of the society. Um, Actually, another proposal that talks about 
people really dislike being in two homogeneous neighborhoods. That, that changes your dynamic, where the fireballs become bad rather than good, and that really changes things. Yeah, uh, there, there are definitely models looking at shelling segregation with this uh, preference for heterogeneity, and they segregate strongly also. Um, so even if people prefer heterogeneity, the society will segregate, which is interesting. Sorry. Are you saying the society will not be stable, which I can imagine? I can imagine how they segregate. When the segregated areas are unhappy, and you model they move if they're unhappy. So I, I, I don't know what the answer yeah, is. Yeah, I... Since maybe the answer is in those dynamics, there is no stable outcome. But I can't imagine I foresee that they I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't know that literature okay. very well. We, we have a break coming up. I promised this slide, so it's enough design your topic. Uh, please don't take them too seriously. Uh, they're rough. And naturally, they don't need to be disowned. They're not, as you well see them. So you can you know, contribute to multiple people. The first person's name is parenthesis is the person who will summarize that discussion. And that person definitely will participate in that discussion. And it's supposed to be covering everything, and then we took care of by having this guy down here. <laughs> 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 uh, but we'll be in a weird way. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a break coming up, and we'll be back at 10.15 uh, for further talks in the morning.